Hello and welcome to this course focusing on virtual private clouds and a number of its related networking components. My name is Stuart Scott and I'm one of the trainers here at Cloud Academy specialising in AWS. Feel free to contact me with any questions using the details shown on screen. Alternatively, you can always get in touch with us by sending an email to support at cloudacademy.com where one of our cloud experts will reply to your question. This course has been created for those who are relatively new to AWS to gain a better understanding of how to construct and architect a virtual private cloud, a VPC. Also, anyone who is looking to learn more about AWS networking features and components, and if you are studying for the AWS Solutions Architect certifications, then you really need to know VPCs inside and out. This course is comprised of nine technical lectures, each covering a different component. As a lot of this content is architectural based, I've created the lectures using a digital drawing pad to sketch the designs as I go, which will hopefully make things easier to absorb as you watch the videos. I'll split the lectures to focus on the components as follows. Firstly, I'll be taking a look at virtual private clouds, explaining what they are and what they are used for. This will then be followed by a lecture explaining and defining what subnets are and how they fit into the VPC architecture. Next, I shall discuss route tables and how they can be used to direct traffic to different destinations, both internally and externally. I then start looking at some of the security features offered, starting with network access control lists, or NACLs, and how they filter traffic at the subnet level of your VPC. And this then leads nicely onto security groups, which filter traffic at the instance level. Following security groups, I dive into NAT gateways, explaining what they are and their different use cases. Then I look at Bastion hosts and how they can be used to access resources within your private subnets from trusted external sources outside of your VPC. I then move focus onto connectivity to and from your VPCs using different methods, starting with how VPN and Direct Connect connectivity operate. And following this, there is a lecture dedicated to VPC peering, which explains how to connect two VPCs together to access resources in each VPC from each other. And then finally, I look at the VPC Transit Gateway, which allows multiple VPCs and remote sites and data centers to connect to each other with simplicity and ease. The course will then be rounded off by a summary detailing key points from all the previous lectures. By the end of this course, you will be able to confidently architect a VPC across multiple subnets within a single region. You will have the knowledge to explain different networking components commonly used within AWS VPCs, and you will also have an understanding of how to secure your VPCs, helping you to protect your resources within them. Finally, you'll be able to assess which method of connectivity to your VPCs would be best in different scenarios. To get the most from this course, then you should have some exposure to AWS. However, this is not essential as I will explain all the components from the ground up. Feedback on our courses here at Cloud Academy are valuable to both us as trainers and also to students looking to take the same course in the future. If you have any feedback, positive or negative, I would really appreciate it if you could contact support at cloudacademy.com. That brings me to the end of this lecture. Coming up next, I shall be providing an overview of the AWS Virtual Private Cloud, the VPC. Hello and welcome, and I'm going to be talking to you about VPCs, Virtual Private Clouds. Now to understand what a VPC is, let's just take a look at the AWS infrastructure. So here is the AWS Cloud. Very simple. And a VPC resides inside of the AWS Cloud and it's essentially your own isolated segment of the AWS Cloud itself. So here is your VPC sitting inside the AWS Cloud. Now by default, when you create your VPC, the only person that has access to this is your own AWS account, just you. It is totally isolated and no one else can gain access to your VPC other than your own AWS account. Now, obviously there are millions upon millions of other VPCs within the AWS network, created by other customers all across the world. So there are millions of customer VPCs. However, they do not have access to your VPC and likewise, you do not have access to their VPC. Now, what would you use a VPC for? Well, essentially, it allows you to start deploying resources within your VPC. For example, different compute resources or storage or database and other network infrastructure, among others. 
And this allows you to start building and deploying your solutions within the cloud. Now by default, from a limitation perspective, you are allowed up to five VPCs per region per AWS account. And it's very simple to create a VPC. All you need to do is to give it a name when you create your VPC and also define an IP address range that the VPC can use. And this is done in the form of a CIDR block, which stands for classless interdomain routing. And I'll talk more about that when I talk more about subnets in a few minutes. So just to recap at a high level, simply put, a VPC is an isolated segment of the AWS public cloud that allows you to provision and deploy resources in a safe and secure manner. I now want to dive deeper into the VPC architecture and start talking about subnets and how you can segment your VPC out into different areas across multiple availability zones for resiliency and high availability. So let's take a look. So now we know what a VPC is, let's take a look at subnets. Now subnets reside inside your VPC and they allow you to segment your VPC infrastructure into multiple different networks. Now you might want to do this to create better management for your resources or to isolate certain resources from others or even to create high availability and resiliency within your infrastructure. So let's take a look at the subnets. Firstly, let me just draw our VPC quickly. So this is our VPC. And I mentioned when talking about VPCs that when you create your VPC, there's two pieces of information that you need. You need to give it a name and also a CIDR block address. Now the CIDR block address is a range of IP addresses. And this CIDR block range can have a subnet mask between a range of IP addresses from a slash 16 all the way through to a slash 28. Now, if you're not familiar with TCP IP addressing, now please take a look at the link on screen and check out the following course, and this will dive into the CIDR block and TCP IP addressing in greater detail. Now, for our example, let's say we created our VPC with the following CIDR block, 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Now, this is important because any subnets that we create within our VPC need to reside within this CIDR block range. So let's take a look at a couple of subnets. Now in this section, I wanna to talk to you about public subnets and also private subnets. So let's just create a public subnet there and also a private subnet here. This yellow one can be our public subnet and the green one can be our private subnet. Now, similarly, when we create a VPC, we need to give it a side block range. We need to do the same with our subnets as well. So let's say, for example, this is 10.0.1.0 slash 24. Now, this range of addresses sits within this bigger side of block here. And then this private subnet can be 10.0.2.0 slash 24. And again, this side of block sits within the bigger VPC CIDR block. Now what makes a subnet public and what makes a subnet private? Well essentially a public subnet is accessible from outside of your VPC. So essentially from the internet. So any resources created within your public subnet, for example, web servers would be accessible from the internet. Now, because we want these web servers accessible from the internet, they have two IP addresses. So they have their own internal IP address, which will be within the range of the subnet, which for this subnet is 10.0.1.0 slash 24. And then also we'll assign them a public IP address as well, because to be accessible from the internet, the instance itself has to have a public IP address. Any resources created within your private subnet, for example, your backend databases, would be considered private and inaccessible by default from the internet. So how do you make a subnet public and how do you make one private? When you create a subnet, you create them both exactly the same. It's what you configure afterwards that will dictate if a subnet is public or private. There's two changes you need to make to your infrastructure to make a subnet public. The first is to add an internet gateway. Now an internet gateway is a managed component by AWS that is attached to your VPC and acts as a gateway between your VPC and the outside world. So essentially the internet. 
So let's just add in an internet gateway here. IGW for internet gateway. So now we have our internet gateway attached to our VPC. And this internet gateway then also connects out to the internet. So we now have a bridge between our isolated VPC to the internet via the internet gateway, which is managed by AWS. Now you might think that the public subnet now has access to the internet because there's an internet gateway. However, before the public subnet can access the internet, we need to add a route to the public subnet's root table. Now associated with every subnet when it's created will also be an associated root table. Now you can have the same root table associated to multiple subnets, that's not a problem. However, you can't associate more than one root table to a single subnet. Now by default, when your subnet's created, it will have a default root in it, and this is a local root. Let's take a look. Now your root table will contain a destination field and also a target field. Now the destination field is the destination address that you are trying to get to. The target essentially specifies the route to that destination. Now within every root table that's created, there will be this local route here. Now what this enables your subnets to do is simply talk to each other. So any subnet within your VPC is able to communicate with each other without you having to configure any routes. It's there by default. Every root table has this local route, it can't be deleted, and it simply allows all subnets within your VPC to communicate with each other. So what we need to do is we need to add a route to this root table that's associated to the public subnet. Now this new route here that's been added to the root table has a destination of 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0. Now that essentially means that for any IP address that's not known within the root table already, send it to this target. Now this target is the internet gateway as shown by the IGW. This part here is simply the ID of the internet gateway. So by adding this route to the root table, this public subnet now knows exactly how to get to the internet by going via the internet gateway as shown in the root table. Now those two components are essentially what makes this subnet public. The fact that we have an internet gateway attached to the VPC and this subnet has a route pointing to the internet gateway for any traffic that it doesn't know how to get to. Now, if we compare the root table of the private subnet, we can see that it only has this local route. So it has no route to the internet gateway. It's not aware that an internet gateway even exists. So it has no route out to the public internet. So this is considered a private subnet. Now, if we go back to the public subnet, before we added this route here, so let's just take that out. This subnet is effectively a private subnet because it doesn't have a route to the internet gateway. So with that in mind, every time you create a subnet, it is a private subnet to begin with. And that is until you attach an internet gateway to your VPC and then add this additional route. So now we've looked at public subnets and also private subnets. Let's now look at architecting multiple subnets across your VPC for high availability and resilience. So let's just clear the screen, give us a blank VPC to work with. So let's consider we have three subnets this time. We'll have a public subnet and we'll have two private subnets. This can be our public subnet and these two will be our private subnets. This will be our web layer, this will be our application layer, and this will be our database layer. So in our public subnet, we will have some web servers. In our application layer, we'll just have some EC2 instances. And in our database layer, we'll just have some databases. So there we have our three tiers of our deployment. So as we know with any subnet, we have a local route. So each of these will all have a local as you can't remove that local route. 
and this enables all of these subnets to communicate with each other. The public subnet, as we know, will also have a route to the internet gateway. Now, when you create a subnet, you have to create it in one of the availability zones that are available within that region. Now, if you're not too familiar with the AWS global infrastructure, then please take a quick read of the blog post below. Let's say, for example, when we created this subnet, we created it in availability zone one. And we've done the same for the remainder of our subnets as well. We placed them all in the same availability zone. And that's all okay. We can deploy our infrastructure all within the same availability zone and our solution will be operating fine. However, should AWS have an issue with availability zone within this region, for example, they might experience a flood or a fire or a natural disaster, and it took out the services to availability zone one. What would happen to our resources? Well, effectively, these would also be taken down because they are all running in availability zone one. So that's not ideal. It's not best practice to deploy all of your resources within the same availability zone within a single reason, simply because it doesn't offer high availability and resilience. So what should you do in that situation? Well, the best thing to do to ensure high availability is to add additional subnets to allow for resiliency. So I'll add an additional web tier and also additional application and also database. So now we have six subnets. And again, we'd replicate our resources. So we'd have our web infrastructure here. We'll have our application servers here and our databases here. Again, now we'll have the routes and an internet gateway route as well. This will have a local route. And as we know, this allows communication between all subnets. So now every subnet can talk to every other subnet with that local route. And also, this also has a route to the internet gateway as well. So now let's look at the availability zones that we deploy our infrastructure in this time. Let's say, for example, we deployed this in AZ1, this application subnet in AZ2, and this database subnet in AZ3. And similarly down here, we had this public subnet in AZ3, this one in one and this final one in two. So now let's run through the scenario again. Let's imagine AZ1 experienced a failure. So what would happen here? This public subnet would be out of action, this application subnet, and that is it. So in this situation, we still have one subnet available in each layer of our infrastructure. So should we experience a failure with availability zone one, our services will remain up and running. So let's do the same with availability zone two. What would happen in this situation? Well, both of our public subnets would be okay because they're running in AZ one and three. This application subnet will be down and this database subnet would also be down. So again, at least one subnet in each of our layers is operational and available. So again, our services will still be up and running. Now finally, just for clarity, if we take down availability zone three, this web layer would go, and also this database layer. So again, we still have at least one subnet in each tier or each layer of our infrastructure operational. So this is a much better design. This allows you to ensure your resources stay up and running should a failure occur in one of the availability zones. Before I move on to some security features, let me just clear the screen. So I wanna to talk to you just quickly about IP addressing, just a couple of points um, that I want to mention with regards to the subnets. So let's just clear this quickly. So I mentioned that when you create your subnet, you have to assign it a CIDR block range that fits within the VPC CIDR block. So say for example, we created a subnet here and we gave the subnet the address of 10.0.1.0 slash 24. 
Now with a slash 24 mask, this gives this subnet a total of 256 IP addresses. You can only actually use 251 IP addresses. And I'll explain why. So the very first IP address in this subnet is 10.0.1.0. And this is known as the network address. Now you're not able to use this as an IP address to assign to your host addresses. This is reserved for networking. Now the next available IP address after the network address is 10.0.1.1. And this is reserved for AWS routing. So again, like the network address, you can't use this address as a host address in your subnet. Now the next available IP address is 10.0.1.2. And again, this one is reserved by AWS, but this time for DNS. So you cannot use this IP address. Now the fourth IP address that you won't be able to use in this subnet is 10.0.1.3. And this is actually reserved by AWS for future use. Now the fifth and final address that you can't use in an AWS subnet is the last available address in the subnet. So in this case, it would be 10.0.1.255. And the last address in any subnet is known as the broadcast address. And again, you cannot use this for host resources. So in working with TCP IP addresses within your subnet, first four addresses in any subnet are reserved and you cannot use for host addresses. And also the very last address is reserved. So that's why there's only 251 IP addresses available to you that you can use to assign to your host resources. So now we've covered what a VPC is, we've looked at subnets, both public and private, and also how it's best to architect your subnets across multiple availability zones for high availability. So now let's look at some security features. I'm gonna start with network access control lists. Let's take a look. Security is a key part of any deployment within AWS and managing security around your virtual private clouds is no different. So I want to talk to you about a couple of different components here. Firstly, I want to talk to you about NACLs, which are network access control lists. Now these are essentially virtual network level firewalls that are associated to each and every subnet and they help to control both ingress and egress traffic moving in and out of your VPC and between your subnets. So let's just quickly draw out our VPC. Very simple. And let's just draw in a public subnet, for example. So this is going to be public. Up here we'll have our internet gateway attached to our VPC. And obviously we have a route out to the gateway which then communicates with the internet. So what we can do here to help maintain security is to configure the network access control list associated to this subnet. Now, much like root tables, whenever you create a new subnet, it will also associate a network access control list. Now, by default, this NACL will allow all traffic, both inbound and outbound. So it's not very secure. So it's a really good practice to configure your NACLs to only allow the traffic that you want to come in and out of your subnet. Now with this being our public subnet, we'll probably have some web servers in here, talking over HTTP and HTTPS. So let's look at the inbound network access control list that could be associated to this subnet. Now, as you can see, there's a number of different fields. We have the raw number, the type, the protocol, port range, source, and allow or deny. Now, the raw numbers allow you to specify what order the rules will appear in within inside the NACL. And as soon as traffic hits one of these rules where it matches all the type, protocol, port range, and source, etc., it will carry out the action at the end, whether that is allow or deny. So let's look at the requirements required to match this rule here. The type of traffic will need to be HTTP under port 80, using the TCP protocol, and again the port range is 80, as that's what's used for HTTP. Now the source can be any IP address. So any IP address running HTTP coming into our subnet will be 
allowed. So as long as they're running this protocol, then the traffic will be allowed inbound into our public subnet. Now let's look at the second rule. Now the second rule uses HTTPS, using the TCP protocol, using port 443, and again, any source. And the action will be allowed. Now the last rule here. Now this is a default rule that's applied at the end of every network access control list. And that's why it doesn't have a rule number. And it states that all traffic using any protocol and any port range from any IP address then deny that access. So this rule is kind of a cover rule. So basically what that allows you to do is ensure that any traffic that doesn't meet the rules that you've entered is deleted and denied access to your subnet. So with this in mind, the only traffic allowed in our public subnet is essentially HTTP and HTTPS, which is exactly what we want for our web servers here. And all other traffic will be denied. So that's the inbound knuckle. Let's now take a look at the outbound. Now the field types are all exactly the same other than this one here. This has a destination, whereas on the inbound, it has the source. So on the outbound, we restrict traffic against its destination. So the first rule we have here says, any traffic using any protocol and any port range going to any destination, then allow that traffic. Anything else should be denied. But in this case, there wouldn't be anything else because this outbound rule is essentially saying, send any traffic you want to using any protocol out from this subnet to any destination. Now, an important point to make about NACLs is that they are stateless. And this means that any response traffic generated from a request will have to be explicitly allowed and configured in either the inbound or the outbound rule set, depending on where the response is coming from. Now, again, much like root tables, you can have the same NACL applied to a number of subnets but only a single NACL can be associated to one subnet. So network access control lists are a great way to control traffic that comes into and out of a particular subnet. Let me now talk about security groups, and these are another method of controlling traffic, but this time they work at the instance level rather than the network level like NACLs do. So staying with security, I now want to talk to you about security groups. Now, these are similar to network access control lists where they filter traffic both inbound and outbound. But whereas NACLs worked at the subnet level, security groups work at the instance level. And I'll explain more about this as we go. So let's say we have three subnets. Okay, so let me just draw these out quickly. And these will be three private subnets, for example. Each of them will have their IP addresses listed. First one being 10.0.1.0/24.2.0, and the last one 3.0. Now, this first subnet will have EC2 instances in them. The second subnet will have RDS instances running MySQL or Aurora. And the last subnet here will also have EC2 instances in them. Now, each of these three subnets are associated to the same network access control list. So this one is linked, this one, and also this one. And this network access control list looks like this. And this is simply saying that any traffic that is running a TCP protocol across any port range from any source, then allow it and deny all other traffic. So between these subnets, any TCP protocol and any port can be used. And for simplicity, the same NACL rules are being used for both inbound and outbound. Now that's not very secure, it's not very restrictive, but from a subnet network level, that is what it's controlling. Now what we want to do is to restrict access to which instances can actually talk to our RDS and Aurora databases here. Now we only want to allow access from this subnet over here and deny access from this subnet here. And we can use security groups to do just that. 
So let's take a look at the security group for this subnet here, for where our databases are. Now security groups have similar feel to knuckles, but there's just a, a couple less. So there's no rule number with a security group, which means all the rules within the security group will be assessed before a decision is made on the action. And you'll also notice there's no allow or deny either. With security groups, if there's a rule in there, then it's considered allowed. If there's no rule, then all traffic is dropped by default. So with this security group, it's stating that any MySQL or Aurora traffic using a TCP protocol on the port 3306 from the source 10.0.1.0, which is this subnet here, then it's considered allowed. As we don't have another rule in this security group for the source of 10.0.3.0 slash 24, which is this subnet here, then it's considered denied. It doesn't exist, so it's not allowed access. So how do both these knuckles and security groups work together? Well, the knuckle works at the subnet level. So let's say the knuckle is this purple line. And as this knuckle is associated to this subnet, as an example, let's just put that knuckle around the edge of the subnet like so. And let's say this orange is our security group. And that security group is associated to our databases inside this subnet. So let's assume that our EC2 instances here are looking to communicate with the RDS and Aurora databases over here. So let's have a look how that traffic would flow through the NACL and also the security group. So the request would be sent, it would get to the NACL, and the NACL would say, okay, is this traffic, TCP traffic, within this port range from any source? And it is, so the traffic is allowed. So that traffic is now allowed inside the subnet. It then hits the security group. And the security group says, is this a MySQL or Aurora traffic running the TCP protocol using port range 3306 coming from 10.0.1.0? And it is, as we're trying to communicate with the databases, then access is allowed. Now, if we look from this subnet here, the 10.0.3.0, and do the same thing, where these EC2 instances are trying to communicate with the RDS and Aurora instances using port 3306. Let's follow the same process. So the request is sent, it hits the NACL. The NACL says, are you running TCP within this port range from any source? The answer is yes, so access is allowed. It then hits the security group and it says, is this traffic MySQL or Aurora using TCP protocol on port range 3306. At this point, everything is correct, yes. However, the source is different. We don't have a source address of 10.0.3.0. It doesn't exist in the security group. So at this point, the traffic is dropped at the security group and access is not allowed. So you can see how knuckles and security groups can be used to filter traffic at different layers. The knuckles are used for the subnet and network layer and the security groups are used at the instance layer. Now one final thing I wanna say about security groups is that unlike knuckles, which are stateless by design, security groups are stateful, which means you don't have to configure specific rules to allow return traffic from requests like you have to do with knuckles. I now want to talk to you about another VPC component and that is the NAT gateway. To help explain what this does, let me just draw out our VPC quickly. So we have a very simple VPC, and we'll have two subnets in this VPC. We'll have our public subnet, and also we'll have a private subnet as well. And it's the private subnet that we're going to be focusing on. So this will be our public, and the green one will be our private subnet. Now obviously we'll have an internet gateway attached to our VPC which will then connect out to the internet. Okay, so we have a public subnet and a private subnet. Now in our private subnet, we'll have a number of EC2 instances run in our applications. And in our public subnet, we're likely to have a number of web servers as well. As we know, each of these subnets also have a root table attached. Public root table will have access to the internet gateway and also to the other private subnet.
Now we need to start thinking about security again. Now, looking at our EC2 instances in the private subnet, we are responsible as a part of the AWS shared responsibility model to update and patch the operating systems running on each of our EC2 instances. Now, if you're not familiar with the AWS shared responsibility model, I suggest you take a look at it. It's critical to all of your AWS deployments, and it essentially defines the boundaries of security as to what your roles and responsibilities are of implementing security within the cloud and what AWS's responsibility is of maintaining security of the cloud. For more information, you can take a look at this blog post here. Okay, so with that in mind, if we have the responsibility of maintaining the operating systems of our EC2 instances, then we need to be able to download updates as and when we need to. However, this subnet is private, meaning it has no access to the internet gateway and therefore the internet. So how can we download those updates? Well, what we can do, we can add a NAT gateway. Now a NAT gateway sits within the public subnet. Because it sits within the public subnet, it has to have a public IP address in the form of an EIP, which is an elastic IP address. And this is assigned to the instance itself. Now because it sits within the public subnet, it has a route out to the internet gateway and to the internet. Now once we have our NAT gateway set up and configured, we need to update the root table of our private subnet. Now by default, our root table in our private subnet will just have the local root that all root tables have. But if we update that to provide a root to the NAT gateway, we can see that I've added this additional root in here. Now this looks very familiar to the root we add to the public subnet to get access to the internet via the internet gateway. And it is essentially the same. So we'll add the 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, which is essentially a destination to any IP address unknown in the root table already. Then send it to the target of the NAT gateway. Now you can tell it's a NAT gateway as this first part here is prefixed with NAT. And then this section along here is essentially the ID of the NAT gateway within your VPC. So what this root table is telling us is that if any resource within this subnet needs to gain access to the internet to perform an update, then it can do so via our NAT over here. This NAT gateway will then take the request, go via the internet gateway, and download the appropriate software that's required and send it back to the EC2 instance requesting it. Now the important thing with a NAT gateway is that it will not accept any inbound communication initiated from the internet. It will only accept outbound communications originating from within your VPC. So it will deny all inbound traffic that's been initiated from the internet. Now the NAT gateway itself is managed by AWS, so you don't have to provision the instance itself. It's very easy to do. You simply create the NAT gateway, specify what subnet it should reside in and associate an elastic IP address. And AWS will manage all other configuration. Because it's managed by default, AWS will set up multiple NAT gateways for resiliency, but you'll only see the one NAT gateway within your account with the associated ID. Now, earlier I mentioned about configuring your resources across multi-availability zones. So if you do have multiple public subnets in different availability zones, you will need to set up another NAT gateway within that subnet as well. AWS will not automatically deploy a NAT gateway within each of your public subnets. So just as a quick summary, a NAT gateway allows instances within a private subnet access to the internet, but the NAT gateway itself will block all incoming initiations from the internet. So it protects the private subnet in that way. And this allows you to ensure that you maintain security of your EC2 instances, ensuring that their OS is kept up to date and any patch management is taken care of as well. Now the next component I want to talk to you about is the Bastion host. So let's take a look. In this section, I want to talk to you about Bastion hosts. Now consider a scenario where you might have EC2 instances sitting in a private subnet, but you want to be able to gain access to those instances from maybe your home office or from somewhere else on the internet. But because they're sitting in the private subnet, how can you do that? Well, one of the ways you can do this is via a Bastion host. So let's draw out our VPC configuration to allow me to explain how this works. So here we have our VPC. 
we're going to have a public subnet and we'll also have a private subnet as well. So this will be our public and this green one here will be our private. Now obviously we have an internet gateway attached as we have a public subnet, our IGW, and this connects out to the internet. We also have routes added to allow the subnets to talk to each other and also the public subnet to route out to the internet gateway as well. Now also in the outside world we have an engineer. Now this engineer might be sitting at home in their home office in front of their laptop and what they need to do is to connect to resources sitting within the private subnet over here. Now in this private subnet we're going to have a couple of EC2 instances. Now we know it's not possible to initiate an outside request to connect through to the internet down through to the internet gateway of our VPC and then across to our private subnet. It's not possible, there aren't routes to enable us to do that, access isn't allowed, and it's private by design. However, this engineer here needs to gain access to the EC2 instances to perform some maintenance or updates to those resources. Now to enable you to do this, you need to use a bastion host. Now this bastion host sits within the public subnet, and this is just another EC2 instance. Now this instance, to follow best practices, needs to be very secure. It needs to be hardened and very robust. But effectively, it needs to be tightened down to remove any kind of vulnerabilities and loose access controls. Now this EC2 instance is a part of a security group. And this security group needs to be configured as shown. Now what this security group shows is the inbound connectivity and it allows SSH on port 22 from this IP address which is from the engineer's IP. So it's being configured for this engineer over here. So this bastion host will essentially allow an SSH connection coming from our engineer over here. Now that's great because this engineer can then gain access to the bastion host to here. And then what that engineer can do is then use this as like a jump server and connect from the bastion host through to our EC2 instances here. But before any of that can happen, we need to set up another security group for our EC2 instances here. So we'll have another security group around our EC2 instances, and this will be configured as shown. Again, this is the inbound rule set, and we can see that SSH is allowed on port 22 from this source here. Now this source is actually a security group. It's prefixed with SG, which is security group. And this security group is actually this one here that's associated to the Bastion host. So what this is saying is any instances associated to this security group allow inbound SSH from any resource sitting within this security group, which as we know is associated to our Bastion host. So that will just allow the Bastion host SSH access to these instances. So now we have our security group set up and configured. However, let me just talk you through the connection process. So our engineer here will connect to our bastion host. Now the engineer will be able to access the bastion host using the private key. So let's just follow this process through. So the engineer will SSH to our bastion host. So it will connect via the internet. The connection will then come through the internet gateway. Let's assume that any knuckles that we have allow the access and we come to the security group here. Now this security group says allow connection if it's an SSH connection from this IP address. And this is the IP address of our engineer over here. So it allows access through. So now this engineer has access to our bastion host. But now our engineer needs to jump across to our private instances. Now again, we're going to need a private key to do that. Now one method would be to store the private keys on this bastion host and then run the command to SSH and access would be allowed, but that's not best practice at all. We really don't want to be storing private keys within the public subnet or on the bastion host because if this bastion host ever got compromised, then the malicious user will be able to use any private keys that are stored on the bastion host and connect to our private instances, which would be very bad. So how does this engineer 
SSH into our EC2 instances if he doesn't have the private key. Now the best way to do this is to set up something called SSH agent forwarding. Now what this allows you to do is to store the private keys for the instances within the private subnet on your local client. So that when you connect through to the Bastion host, you can then SSH, but using the private key to the EC2 instances that is stored on your client rather than storing it on the Bastion host. Now with that in mind, once you have connected to your Bastion host, using the example I just showed you, you can then SSH into your private instances, at which point it will hit the private security group that allows any SSH access on port 22 from the security group associated with the Bastion host, and then there you can gain access. So just to summarize exactly what we've done here, we started off by creating an EC2 instance within the public subnet marked as our Bastion host. We then hardened that instance to try and protect it against as many security threats as possible and to lock down access to that instance. We then associated a security group that only allowed SSH inbound access from a particular IP address or a particular range of IP addresses. We then added a rule to the security group associated to our private instances that allowed SSH inbound access from the Bastion host security group. You then need to ensure that SSH agent forwarding is configured on your client. And then this allows you to firstly connect to your Bastion host using the private key of the Bastion host, and then using that as a jump server to jump into your private subnet from your Bastion host using the private instances private key, which is also stored on your client PC. In the next section, I'm going to be coming away from the security aspects of VPCs a little bit, and I'm going to be focusing more on VPC connectivity. Hello and welcome to the section and I'm going to be talking about VPN connections, virtual private networks. Now a virtual private network is essentially a secure way of connecting two remote networks across the internet. So let's have a look how we can use VPNs within our AWS and VPC. So if we just create a VPC over here and we also have our remote data center over here with a little door and this is our data center and this is our VPC. Now within our VPC we're going to have a single subnet. Now this is going to be a private subnet so there's no internet gateway and there's no route to the internet gateway as well. It's totally isolated. Set a bit more information relating to IP addressing. So our VPC will have a cider block of 10.0.0.0 slash 16 and for our data center let's say the ip address sits on a 192.168.0.0 address space okay so we have our vpc over here sitting in aws and we have our remote data center over here maybe sitting in london somewhere okay now we have resources within our data center in london and we also have some resources over in our private subnet, for example, some EC2 instances. Now, what we want to do is enable communications between our resources in our private subnet, in our VPC in AWS, and to resources that are held on premise within our data center. Now, we want to do this via a secure connection. So one option is to create a VPN connection, a virtual private network. Now, let's look at some of the components involved with that. Firstly, on your VPC side, you need to create something called a virtual gateway. And this attaches directly to your VPC. Much in the same way an internet gateway does to enable uh, public subnets access out to the internet. And again, this is managed by AWS. So here we have our virtual gateway. Now over in our data center, we also need another endpoint and this will be our customer gateway. And then this can be a piece of hardware or it can be a, a software a virtual appliance. Either way, it needs to be host within your data center. So now we have an endpoint at our data center, the customer gateway, and we also have an endpoint attached to our VPC, the virtual private gateway. Now during the creation of our virtual private gateway, we need to supply some additional 
information that's going to be used on our customer gateway, such as the customer gateway's IP address and the type of routing to be used, whether it's dynamic or static. Now, if you're not familiar with dynamic or static routing, then please see our existing course shown on the screen. And this dives into different types of routing across subnets and across site to site as well. So that'll give you a little bit more in-depth information on how the routing would work. Now, once your virtual private gateway is attached to your VPC and configured, and also your customer gateway is installed, then what we can do is initiate a tunnel between the two endpoints. Now this VPN tunnel can only be initiated from your customer gateway. It can't be initiated from your virtual gateway. Now if there are some idle activity across this link for a period of 10 seconds or more, then this VPN tunnel connection would drop. So to prevent that from dropping, you can set up uh, network monitoring to set up continuous network pings from the customer gateway side to the virtual gateway to ensure that connection remains up and running. So now we have our VPN tunnel up and running, created between our virtual private gateway and our customer gateway. We need to change the root table associated to this private subnet so our EC2 instances know how to connect to the 192.168 network. So let's take a look at that. Now we can see here that we have the local route, which we have with every root table, as we know, but we also have this additional route here. Now the destination is 192.168.0.0/16 which points to our data center network. And the target is this virtual gateway. Now we know it's a virtual gateway because it's prefixed with VGW. And then this is the ID of the virtual gateway itself. And this relates to our virtual gateway up here. So the instances within this subnet now have an additional route that points to this virtual gateway to get to the network of the data center. What you can do is also enable route propagation within your route table as well. Now what this will do is once your VPN tunnel is up and running, then any routes that are represented across your VPN connection will be automatically added to your route table. So you might have other networks within your data center other than the 192.168 that are configured to use that VPN tunnel. And so any traffic from another network received by your virtual gateway will allow these routes to be automatically propagated to the route tables that you've enabled route propagation on. Now, depending on what sort of customer gateway you installed, will depend if it supports the BGP protocol, which is the border gateway protocol. And if it does, then this supports dynamic routing. So this will populate all the routes for the VPN connection for you, which means you won't have to implement any static routing. Now it is recommended that if you can install a customer gateway that does support BGP, then it's probably best to do so. Now once our routes are in place, we also need to ensure we have our security groups configured for our instances as well. To allow traffic to come from our resources over here via the customer gateway across the VPN link to our virtual private gateway and then onto our instances. But as we know, they are protected by a security group. So we need to ensure that the right protocols, etc., are allowed on the inbound rule set of our security group for our resources that are based over here. So if we wanted to allow SSH access, for example, or RDP access, then the security group would look as shown. Now here we can see that this security group allows both SSH and also RDP. And it's from the source 192.168.0.0, which is of course our network that we're using on our data center. So to quickly recap, we have our virtual private gateway attached to our VPC and we have our customer gateway installed at our remote location. We then configure it with either dynamic or static routing and here we have a static route added for our subnet that points to the virtual private gateway within our VPC to get to our destination network which is of course our destination network of the remote data center. And then we also have our security group protecting our resources within our VPC, allowing only specific ports and protocols which are inbound from our remote data center network. So that's just a simple example of a site-to-site -site connection using a VPN, which is a secure connection across the internet. I now want to talk to you about using another site-to-site -site connection called Direct Connect. But this does not use the internet. This is totally isolated infrastructure. So let me explain how this works. 
Okay, so in this section, I'm going to be talking to you about Direct Connect. Now, this is another method of connecting your remote location, such as your data center or remote office, to your AWS environment. Now, where is your VPN connection used the internet to get to your VPC? A Direct Connect connection doesn't traverse the internet. Instead, it uses private infrastructure and connects directly to your VPC. So there's no public network that the traffic traverses. So let's look at the architecture of this to see how it works and how it's different to a VPN. Now I'm not gonna go into fine configuration details on this. I just want to provide you a high level overview of how the Direct Connect infrastructure is presented. So let's take a look. So let's start with our on-premise data center that we'll just have over here. This will be our data center. And within our data center, we'll have a router. Now with a direct connection, there's a middle entity before you get to AWS infrastructure. Now this is usually an AWS partner or an AWS customer that holds direct connect infrastructure. And there's two parts to this. The first part is the partner's infrastructure or, or the customer's infrastructure. And the other part will be managed by AWS. So effectively, we will have a customer side and also an AWS side as well. Now this is all held within a facility owned and managed by a partner of AWS. This is a separate building entirely to your remote data center. Now again, in the customer side, there will also be a router and another router in the AWS side as well. Okay, let's move on to the final section. So here we have our AWS region because with AWS Direct Connect, it enables you to create a connection between your data center and an AWS region. Not just the VPC, it's actually connected to a defined region. So this will be our region here. And within that region, we also have our VPC as well. So this is our VPC. And again, within our VPC, we'll have a subnet with perhaps uh, an EC2 instance in it, for example. Now, the reason it's connected to a region and not a VPC is that a direct connect connection allows you to access public as well as private sources. So an example of a public source could be Amazon S3. And that's because Amazon S3 resources can be accessed over the internet via a public connection. Now, attached to our VPC, we'll also have a virtual gateway, much like we did when we was talking about our VPN connection. Okay, so let me just recap the three elements that we have here before we go any further. So we have our customer data center over here with a router. Now here in the middle, we have our direct connect location. So this is our direct connect location. And this sits between our on-premise data center and our AWS infrastructure. And this is separated into uh, two cages effectively. We have our customer partner router, and we also have the AWS router as well. And then finally, we have our AWS infrastructure over here with our region and inside the region of VPC, and we have our public components over here. Let's just nest that in the AWS cloud. So that all sits within AWS. Now I mentioned previously that you can have a private connection and also a public connection. And as a part of that configuration, you can configure private virtual interfaces and also public virtual interfaces on your router. So let's take a look. So there'll be two virtual interfaces. So one of them will be a private virtual interface and we'll define this by using this gray line here. So that connects from your on-premise router to the customer side of the direct connect location. Now from here, there'll be a cross connect from the customer router to the AWS router within the same direct connect location. And then from here, this virtual private interface will then connect to your virtual gateway. And then this will allow connectivity through to your resources within your VPC. Now the second interface is a public virtual interface. So let's use this reddish color for that. So that again, the connection comes from your on-premise router into the customer side of the direct connect location. Then there's a cross connect across to the AWS router. And from here, it connects to inside of your AWS region. And from here, you can access your public AWS resources such as Amazon S3, etc. So now we've established a connection from our on-premise data center into a region within AWS where we can access both private resources and also public resources. 
and it's all done without having to traverse the public internet. Instead, there's dedicated and isolated infrastructure using the Direct Connect locations. Now to be able to use Direct Connect, the only path that you need to establish is from your on-premise data center to a Direct Connect location to enable you to establish a connection to this customer router here. So as long as you have a dedicated network route to a co-location that provides a Direct Connect connection, then you can establish this dedicated network that we can see here. Now the great thing when working with Direct Connect is that it's private connection and also you get speeds from one through to 10 gigabits per second. Okay, the final section I want to talk to you about in this course is relating to VPC peering and also the transit gateway. So let's take a look at this final section. In this section, I want to talk to you about VPC peering. Now we've looked at VPN connectivity, which looked at connecting your on-premise data center or remote office to your VPC and also Direct Connect, which done the same thing, but over an isolated network. Now with VPC peering, it's relating to connectivity again, but what it allows you to do is to connect two VPCs together. So we have one here and another VPC here. Now, each of these VPCs will have resources in them, EC2 instances or databases, etc. And what we want to allow to happen is for these two VPCs to be able to communicate with each other. Now, these VPCs might be in the same region or they might be in different regions. Either way, we can allow VPC peering to allow them to communicate with each other. Now, the peering connection itself here that links the two VPCs is actually run and hosted on the AWS infrastructure. So this is highly resilient, there's no single point of failure, and also there's no bottleneck to bandwidth either. So it's a very good way of linking two VPCs together to allow you to exchange information and for each VPC to communicate with another. Now you might have multiple VPCs for organization or management, and there will be times when you want resources in one VPC to communicate with another. And a quick and simple solution is to implement VPC peering. Now it's important to mention that this peering connection is a one-to-one -one connection only. So if we had a third VPC down here, call this one VPC3. Again, this had additional resources in as well. And you had a VPC peering connection between two and three. Resources in VPC1 could not go via VPC1 and then through VPC2 to get through to VPC3. That simply is not allowed as it's a one-to-one -one connection only. If you wanted VPC1 to connect to VPC3, then you'd have to set up a separate VPC peering connection between one and three. So that's a very important point when mapping out your peering connections between your VPCs. Now, another important point relates to IP addressing. So if, for example, if VPC1 had an address of 10.0.0.0 slash 16. VPC2 was 172.31.0.0 slash 16. And then VPC3 was also 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Then this connection here would not be possible because when you create VPC pairing connections, each VPC cannot have an IP address overlap between them. And these two VPCs have the same IP addressing scheme. So this VPC connection would not be possible. So that's also something else to bear in mind when creating your VPC peers. So let's take that connection away. Now I also mentioned that you can have VPC peering configured between the same region or between different regions. So let's say VPC1 and VPC2 was in one region and VPC3 was in another region. Then this link here would be an inter-region VPC connection. Let me now run through the process of how this peering connection is initiated. So let me just get rid of what we have on the screen here and start again. So we have two VPCs, our first one, and also our second one, VPC1 and VPC2. Now, now VPC1 is going to be known as the requester and VPC2 is going to be known as the acceptor. 
Now the owner of VPC1 needs to send a VPC peering request to the owner of VPC2. And again, remember, we need to make sure that the cider blocks of these VPCs do not overlap. So that request comes across to the VPC acceptor. And that's the first stage. If the VPC acceptor is happy with that peering connection, then an acknowledgement and acceptance of that request is sent back to the requester. And that's the second stage. And this creates the peering connection between the two. At this stage, each VPC needs to update their routing tables to allow the traffic from VPC1 to get to the destination of VPC2. Now to do this, we need to know the cider blocks of these VPCs. So let's assume VPC1 is 10.0.0.0 slash 16, and VPC2 is 172.31.0.0 slash 16. So they're the two cider blocks that we have for our VPCs, and as we know, they're not overlapping, so from an IP perspective, there's no issues there. So let's now look at the routing table for each of these. So firstly, VPC1. As we can see, we always have our local route, and then we also have this additional route here. So the destination 172.31.0.0 slash 16, which is VPC2, to go via the target of this peering connection. And the PCX simply means that this target is a peering connection. And these digits here are the ID of that peering connection. So now this VPC knows how to get to the 172.31 network by going via the peering connection here. So let's now look at the route table for VPC2. Again, we have our local route, which every route table has, and then also this additional route that points to VPC1, again, across the same peering connection. So this VPC can now access the network of VPC1, again, via the same peering connection. Now, the final part of the configuration would be to modify the security groups that are hosting any resources within your VPC. So we might have a security group here and a security group here, each with EC2 instances or databases. And we'd simply need to update the rules to allow the correct resources, ports and protocols to communicate with each other. So it's a high level overview, that is VPC peering. Now what I want to talk to you about is the AWS Transit Gateway. And again, this looks at how to connect more than one VPC together, but through a one-to-many connectivity method. So let's take a look at that. So the final element I want to talk to you about is the AWS Transit Gateway. And this is essentially a development on from the VPC peering. In today's world, we're using more and more VPCs to segment and manage different workloads. And as our organization gets bigger and bigger, we're, we're creating more and more VPCs. We have more and more connections from our remote locations, such as our data centers and offices, etc. And creating VPC peering connections to each one of these, bearing in mind it's a one-on-one -on -one connection, can be very cumbersome and time consuming and just not very well to manage. So let's say we had four VPCs represented by these circles here. And we also had a couple of remote offices as well. So one there and one there. Now, if we wanted to connect these VPCs and to our office locations, now based on what we've already spoken about so far, we can use VPC peering to link our VPCs together. But as we know, this is just a one-on-one -on -one connection, so we also need a connection across there and also a connection across there. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six VPC peering connections there. Now one of these remote locations might be using a VPN connection to get to that VPC, and also a VPN connection there, and maybe even a third VPN connection to this VPC as well. And this remote location might be using Direct Connect to get to a couple of different VPCs in different regions. Now that is a lot of connections and a lot of gateways to manage. We have customer gateways at the remote ends and also private gateways within our VPCs as well. What AWS Transit Gateway allows you to do is to connect all of this infrastructure, so all of your VPCs, all of your remote locations, whether it's over Direct Connect or VPN, via a central hub. So let's take a look at how that looks. So again, we have our four VPCs and also we have our two data centers here at the bottom, our two remote locations. However, this time, we have the AWS Transit Gateway in the middle. 
Now for each VPC or remote location that we want to allow to talk to each other, then all we need to do is to create a single connection to the transit gateway. So one from each of the VPCs and also one each from the remote locations as well. Again, these will be a VPN connection and maybe a direct connect connection. So either way, VPN, direct connect or VPC, they all connect to this central hub, this AWS transit gateway. As you can see between the two designs, this one over here has a lot more connections than this one over here. So the AWS transit gateway simplifies your whole network connectivity. It allows all of your VPCs to easily communicate with one another and also communicate with your remote locations as well. All the routing is managed centrally within that hub and when any new remote locations or VPCs are created, for example, you might have another two VPCs created, all you'd need to do is to connect it to the AWS Transit Gateway and each of these new VPCs can then communicate with the entire rest of your infrastructure. Now, because the Transit Gateway goes through this central hub, it allows you to centralize all your monitoring as well for your network traffic and connectivity, all through the one dashboard, which is great. So that was just a very quick high level overview of AWS Transit Gateway and how it differs from the VPC peering. And that's the last component I want to discuss in this course relating to VPCs and network connectivity. So in the final lecture, I'm just going to quickly review what we've covered throughout this course. Hello and welcome to the final lecture of this course where I want to quickly summarize what we've covered throughout the previous lectures. Being able to architect your own isolated segment of AWS is a very simple process. However, understanding how to architect the VPC and its related network components and connectivity makes it a very powerful service. And so this course was intended and designed to give you an overview of what a virtual private cloud is along with some of the network components. I started off by explaining what a VPC is and how it fits within the AWS public cloud. The VPC can be defined as an isolated segment of the AWS network infrastructure, allowing you to securely provision your cloud resources. This then led on to a discussion surrounding subnets. I explained that subnets allow you to segment your VPC CIDR block, forming smaller network segments across multiple availability zones within your VPC region. This then helps you to isolate, organize, and manage your resources in addition to helping you implement resilience and high availability. I also touched on what an internet gateway is, and I explained that this is an AWS managed component attached to your VPC, and it provides a connection between your isolated VPC and the outside world, essentially the internet. To enable a subnet to use the internet gateway, it needs a route. Now, route tables enable you to configure where and how to route your network traffic based on its destination via different targets, such as an internet gateway, a NAT gateway, or a virtual private gateway. I then shifted my focus to look at the security of a VPC. I began looking at network access control lists, more commonly known as NACLs. These effectively act as a logical firewall, providing network level security at the subnet level. And they are stateless by design and provide a rule base allowing you to stipulate both the ingress and egress traffic based on protocols. And these rules have an action associated that will then either allow or deny the traffic. Keeping with security, I then spoke about security groups, and these are similar to NACLs in many ways, but they operate at the instance layer instead, providing a level of security to your instances residing within your subnets, again, based on defined protocols. Now, security groups are stateful, and any rules within the rule base are considered allowed, as security groups do not offer a deny function like NACLs do. Next, I touched on NAT gateways, and these allow instances located within a private subnet to access the internet allowing them to download and perform patch updates for maintenance. Now the NAT gateway prevents any inbound connection that is initiated from the internet, which helps to protect your private resources. The NAT gateway itself is located in a public subnet and is a managed instance provided by AWS. The final part relating to security in your VPC that I covered was the use of Bastion hosts. Now a Bastion host is a secure and hardened instance that resides in the public subnet of your VPC. It has very restrictive security controls, allowing restricted inbound connections from known and trusted IP addresses, usually using SSH or RDP protocols. And these security controls then allow your engineers to perform a remote and secure connection to the Bastion host, 
where the instance acts as a jump server, allowing engineers to SSH or RDP into instances residing in your private subnets. Following security, I began looking at connectivity options for your VPC to connect to remote locations, and this is when I discussed VPN connectivity. Now, a virtual private network or VPN connection allows two networks to securely connect to each other across the internet. You could use a VPN connection to allow your remote office or data center to connect your VPC, allowing traffic to move between both networks. Now, a direct connect connection also allows you to connect your VPC to a remote office or data center. However, this connection is established across dedicated and secure infrastructure rather than the public internet. And this connection goes from your remote location to a direct connect location, which is usually managed by an AWS partner using dedicated infrastructure. From here, the connection is then made to the AWS network, allowing a secure and private connection to your VPC. I then looked at VPC peering. Now, VPC peering allows you to connect two VPCs together using the internal AWS infrastructure as if they were on the same network. There are some key points to bear in mind, mainly that the two VPCs are not allowed to have overlapping CIDR blocks, and VPC peering provides a one-to-one -one connection and so does not allow transitive peering to a third VPC. For example, if you have three VPCs connected, VPC1 connected to VPC2 and VPC2 connected to VPC3, then VPC1 would not be able to connect to VPC3. You would have to either set up another peer between VPC1 and VPC3 or implement the AWS Transit Gateway. Now, the AWS Transit Gateway allows you to perform a one-to-many relationship with your VPCs in addition to your remote networks as well. The Transit Gateway acts as a central hub within your network, allowing all VPCs and remote offices to connect to it. And this configuration simplifies multiple peering connections and reduces the overall connections required across your infrastructure, including those from remote locations as well. That has now brought me to the end of this course, and so I hope now that you have a clearer understanding of VPCs and its related network architecture. If you have any questions or feedback, positive or negative, please do get in touch with us here at Cloud Academy by sending an email to support at cloudacademy.com. Thank you again for taking the time to watch this course. I thoroughly enjoyed creating it. So that just leads me to say, good luck with your continued learning of cloud computing, and thank you.